unshare. Hello, everyone. So nice to see everybody. And I see some familiar faces joining our roundtable today. Um, we're so happy to have all of you with us. Um, we want to thank you all for coming to our May installment of the Amgen Biotech Experience Teacher Roundtable Series. I'm Jessica Juliuson, and I'm the Director of Community and Strategy for the ABE Program Office, and it's always a pleasure for me to host this roundtable series. For those of you who are new, these roundtables are designed for our incredible ABE teacher community from around the world, and it's a chance really for teachers to hear and to learn from both experts and from each other about topics of specific interest to science and biotechnology teachers. So we hope you find this series valuable. Please feel free to tag us in social media if you want to share your thoughts. We use the tag at ABE Prague Office, which Sarah will drop into the chat for everybody. And today's roundtable focuses on hearing from fellow ABE educators about their successful strategies for integrating career skills into their ABE curriculum with examples of approaches, resources, and tools that they've used that can help you bring career readiness into your own classroom. And if you have great ideas of your own, we really would love for you to share those in the chat as the roundtable progresses. This roundtable will be recorded and posted on our website and registered participants will also receive a transcript of the discussion discussion and a copy of any materials shared today. We'll have hopefully some time for audience questions at the end of the roundtable. So please, we encourage you to put your questions in the chat at any time during the discussion at the bottom of your screen. And we will be sure to watch for those and to ask your questions at the end. So I'm going to jump right in by introducing our panelists today. Dr. Lori jackson Grusby teaches biotechnology at Brockton High School at ABE, Massachusetts, since changing careers from academic biomedical research. She serves as the academic lead for the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center-sponsored apprenticeship program and the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education-sponsored Innovation Pathway in Healthcare at Brockton High School. Dr. jackson Grusby strives to incorporate student choice and agency as they approach scientific phenomena. And Lori was a member of the second cohort of ABE Master Teacher Fellows in 2021-22, and will be serving as an advisor and contributor to the upcoming ABE Career Connections Toolkit, which is coming next fall. Dr. David Upegi, or just Upegi, as he is known to his students, joins us from ABE Rhode Island. David completed his doctoral degree in education at the University of Rhode Island. He is a Latino immigrant who found his way out of poverty through science. He serves as a science teacher at Central Falls High School and as an adjunct professor of education. His inclusive approach to science education enables students to become problem solvers and innovative thinkers. He received the U.S. National Association of Biology Teachers Outstanding Biology Teacher Award in 2021 after previously receiving the Evolution Education Award in 2014 and the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching in 2019. Since that time, he's contributed to several publications on science education and appropriate pedagogy. David was one of the very first ABE Master Teacher Fellows, and his 2020 fellowship project was on race as a social construct. He has continued his work through an ABE mini grant, which he has used to engage his citizens, his students in citizen science through the International Barcode of Life Project. It's always a pleasure to have David join us. He's kind of a celebrity on our circuit. Um, Dr. Wendy Wooten is also a celebrity. She's an ABE teacher from ABE Greater Los Angeles, and you can see her likeness if you walk into Amgen Thousand Oaks. She is a science teacher who teaches biology, chemistry, and physics, as well as career technical education, or CTE, teacher focusing on biotech and engineering. Wendy has over 40 years of teaching experience and is passionate about providing current, authentic experiences for students to help them become future leaders in STEM. Wendy was an ABE Master Teacher Fellow in 2021-22 and developed a fellowship project that consisted of both student curriculum and teacher professional development on synthetic biology and its connection to solving real-world problems. So it's no surprise that Wendy is joining us today from a field trip for her students as she seeks every opportunity to get her kids out in the world and seeing science. It is such a pleasure to have Wendy with us today to share her expertise with all of us. So it's it's not my fault they have so much um, so many distinguished experiences and that's why it takes so long to introduce them but we're going to jump right into some questions now 
Um, and so we'll begin by getting to know just a bit more about our panelists and their journeys as educators. So Lori, for those participants who don't know you, can you please tell us a little bit about your pathway into science teaching, your current school and students, and the leadership role you play now with ABE Massachusetts? Happy to. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so I started, I, I made a career pivot between 2015 and 2017. Um, and so I was an academic researcher, had a lab at Boston Children's Hospital. My PhD is in genetics, um, postdoc at MIT, you know, lab experience. And all through that whole time, I was very into the teaching aspect of my job as like an important part of my um, my job description and my sense of purpose. And so when grant funding became difficult to come by, I just decided for myself, like I want to figure out how I can make education the center of what I do. And so the way that I did that was I um, went to a teacher residency program um, at a local high school and then transitioned into becoming um, a teacher at Brockton High School. So Brockton High uh, is a Title I school. It's one of the largest schools in the US. It was the largest school um, east of the Mississippi for the longest time. Um, enrollment of north of 4,000 students. At one point, it was 4,500 students. Um, and so we serve a very diverse community of students uh, with a wide range of both socioeconomic, racial, um, any any kind of demographic you can think of, we've got a wide diversity of that. And, and so biology is our testing subject in our school. And sometime, maybe like 10, 12 years ago, it was decided to try and create a pathway in biotechnology where students would get more of a hands-on experience. And instead of teaching biology in one year and having those kids test, they get two years and it's framed as biotechnology and it's much more project-driven, hands-on learning um, than in a traditional classroom. So our students still test for biology, um, but it created this avenue for these career connections that we're here to talk about today. Thank you so much, Lori. And I've put a brief explanation of Title I in the chat, but for those of you not from the US, Title I schools serve high percentages of students um, of low socioeconomic status. Um, so thank you so much for that, Lori. David, how about you? What was your path to science teaching and your role with ABE Rhode Island? Yes, thank you. And I'd like to just second uh, what Lori just said. Welcome, and I hope that this is somewhat useful for you to think about um, how to engage kids in not only thinking about their own personal development, but how th those talents that they possess, once they're developed, can serve their greater humanity. So I was um, a researcher um, in public health, and my oldest son was born in 2004, and he was born with Down syndrome. It literally uh, shook the very core of what I believe was important in life. And it allowed me to reconsider, or as Thomas Kuhn would say, the, the paradigm shift. How is it that the new data is going to fit into my reality? So uh, I went back to school and got a teaching certificate. And I now teach at my alma mater, Central Falls High School, which is the most um, economically disadvantageous city in the state of Rhode Island. So I get a chance to teach kids um, that like my own uh, personal background are dealing with the, the, the ugliness of poverty. And I'm empowering them, I hope, through the use of uh, science. Thank you so much, David. And it's been an inspiration to, to me personally to hear you speak about this. And for those of you who haven't seen it, we have a blog about David and his students on our website. So we encourage you to check that out if you can. And Wendy, I'll continue with you. Um, you're just kind of a rock star among our ABE community. Can you tell us a little bit about how and why you became a science teacher and about your school and students in greater Los Angeles? Uh, yes, and, and it sounds like um, the three of us have similar backgrounds in that um, we were in research, um, high, you know, higher education, um, and again, like David, I had a situation related to family. My uh, younger daughter was put into afternoon kindergarten uh, when LA, the Los Angeles Unified School District initiated it because they didn't plan on having enough schools for the baby boomers. 
So uh, there was no daycare available for taking care of afternoon kindergarten. So I did a year of kindergarten daycare. So um, I went from teaching post-secondary to teaching kindergarten students. The only difference is they're a little shorter. Um, but uh, basically the kindergarten teacher's husband was the uh, department science department chair in LAU and LAUSD high school. And he said, oh, you know, why don't you, you know, start teaching high school? And he invited me to teach at his school. So um, I think a little bit of difference in my background is that um, I started college as an engineering major. So I graduated with a double major in biology and physics. So I started out teaching uh, the AP chemistry and honors chemistry at this high school. I, after four years, uh, another high school, which was closer to home, they needed a physics teacher because the physics teacher there that they just hired only lasted two weeks. So then I went to teaching physics and um, I got sucked into first robotics. And so anybody from the Boston area or MIT, um, uh, we were building robots and, and uh, we created a team that ended up winning, winning the National Chairman's Award at First Robotics, so on. Um, but then um, I was asked to help start a, a charter school, High Tech High, with an engineering department and robotics program. But then uh, after teaching there for a while, the principal uh, uh, wanted to make it an independent charter, so they left LA Unified. And if I stayed longer than five years, I was going to end up without lifetime health benefits. So then I went to Reseda Charter High School. It was, well, basically then it was Reseda High School. Everybody's a charter high school now, so they can attract parents to get bring their kids. Um, but uh, uh, I then got to go to my true love, which is, is biological, molecular life science, basically. And I started a uh, biomedical science pathway uh, with, I have to say, with the help and support of ABE because it was the curriculum that really um, propelled me into all of the industry connections that I'll, I'll talk about a little later. But our school is Title I. We're uh, considered 100% free and reduced lunch because we have over 85% socioeconomically disadvantaged students. Uh, it's um, mostly Hispanic students, um, but still with a lot of diversity um, with other ethnicities um, and uh, just, you know, just again, trying to give them as many opportunities to uh, be successful in the future and develop a love of science. Thank you so much, Wendy. And it's actually kind of a perfect segue as you talk about sort of these opportunities through ABE. Um, you know, some folks may be thinking why, you know, we're talking about career connections. What does that have to do with science teaching or the science classroom? And so I'd like to dive into that a little more and say, maybe beginning with David, what first grabbed your interest in making career connections within your science classroom? And why do you think that's important for your students? A school is really a sort of, I, I, I call it a playground for students to figure out who they are and what the world is like. And so in many ways, opportunities for students to see themselves as part of the greater world are significant in allowing them to connect what we're learning to what the future can be. And it's really important that, that um, I highlight the fact that science in my eyes is the most democratic of all endeavors that we do in school, right? We don't care who said it, how many times they repeated it, how loudly they said it, because science ultimately depends on publicly verifiable evidence. And in that sense, it's democratic. And I want my students to understand and value the fact that science is not dead, that it's a continuously growing body of knowledge, and that they can be full participants in that quest of understanding our natural world. So in that way, I think the connection is for students to recognize that there's a greater world out there. Sometimes it's easy for my students to think that, well, of course, you Peggy wants me to do well because he looks like my uncle Carlos. And that may be true, but that's not all, right? The whole world needs these kids to develop these talents because we're in need of real solutions for real problems that we're facing as a humanity. 
And it's especially important now as we begin to realize the gaps that have existed, you know, between some of our populations in, within the United States, outside the United States, and the discoveries and the research and the trials that have gone before then, that there, there are gaps there and there is, um, there's an equity there. And so having a democratically um, participatory um, bench of scientists, for lack of a better term, um, becomes so important. And so I want to ask you the same question, Wendy. Um, when did you first kind of start thinking, if you can think back, that career connections were important for your students? And how did you first begin helping students? Okay, so I, I started teaching, you know, with that stand and deliver methodology. And it wasn't until um, I started doing robotics where in first robotics, uh, you're given um, a game for which you have to de uh, design and build a robot to participate or compete in. And um, so basically it was the discovery that if you give students a, a real world authentic challenge and you give them the resources and opportunities and then just get out of their way, they learn and achieve so much more than you could have ever given them, you know, by lecturing and, and that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, I've always tried to get kids into real world situations. Um, and that's happened through, you know, different industry connections that have been developed um, and get them to experience that um, excitement and um, engagement in them solving the problems. And then they'll move on to be the people that solve the problems in the future. I love that. And I always think, you know, as new teachers, sometimes you don't realize that it's actually easier to teach with engaging authentic content than trying to deliver the perfect lecture every time. And that's kind of learning that you get along the way as you go. But the kids love to know the answer to why are we doing this and, and having that be clear. Um, Lori, how about for you? What was kind of your first experience with realizing that career connections matter for your students? And how did you go about it? So to be honest, that realization happened when I was running my own research lab. So I um, was always signing up for opportunities when we would have middle schools visit, high school students in the summer. So I had obviously undergrads and, and more advanced um, students and researchers, but anytime I could allow a high school student to spend a few months in my lab working side by side with me and with somebody in my lab who had, you know, a good set of hands and, and was very good at explaining things, um, I wanted to get kids right from the jump. And, and just seeing like eighth graders putting on a lab coat and safety glasses and um, it, just like seeing them light up in those moments, you, it's just pretty obvious that, that, you know, it's a way to connect with them. And once they're, once you have them in those moments, now they're open up to everything else that you want to have them have conversations with them about. I love that you can also share that experience kind of coming from both as a, an industry practitioner and seeing how you could engage with students. And then as a teacher, how you could kind of work from the other direction and engage your students with industry practitioners. And that's kind of a, you know, sometimes an eye opener for people is to realize it really can be that two way street with that participatory education um, for students, a more holistic education for students. Um, and so I want to move into kind of advice or insights. I know you're going to be all sharing some examples of what you do in just a couple of minutes. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to ask if as you have engaged your students with real world projects, with industry practitioners, with the concept of careers and career pathways, um, what kinds of advice have you would you give to teachers who may be just trying it out or what lessons might you have learned along the way, whether the hard way or the easy way? So I'll start with you, Wendy. Any advice or insights you have for teachers just trying this out? Yeah, um, I think the advice I would give is that um, when you give students the opportunity to, um, you know, make these connections um, to like see themselves in a um, situation where they observe how uh, uh, an industry professional carries out their career and that their people just 
you know, just normal people. It, it's really empowering to the students and it gives them confidence that, hey, I could probably do this too, um, as opposed to the, um, you know, like the superhero uh, image of, you know, a, a scientist. It's like, oh, I don't know if I could ever do something like that. But when you when you put them in a situation where they're shoulder to shoulder with um, researchers and, and industry professionals, and um, they're doing a project or something, and they're, you know, being successful and achieving something, then that gives them the motivation and confidence to, um, you know, say, I, I want to pursue this, I enjoy it, and I think I can do it. I love what you're saying about kind of humanizing the image of what it means to be in science, quote unquote, and to put people's faces on that and help students see themselves in science. Um, Lori, how about for you? Any advice or insights that you've gained along the way as you've attempted to make these connections with and for your students? Yeah, I, I really want to echo what Wendy said. So that I think that is really the crux of it is that a kid needs to identify with that role to take ownership of it. And so I, I think David even said this earlier of his, himself and his students. Um, so that has really been our agenda is really trying because we've got a diverse student body is really trying to make connections with a variety of different avenues, um, making sure that the scientists that our students are interacting with reflect that diversity so that every kid has an opportunity of seeing somebody that they can see, you know, reflects who they might become. And David, I'll wrap up this portion of the roundtable by asking you the same questions. Um, learnings, challenges, advice that you have for new teachers? Yeah, I'll make it quick because I want to build on both what Wendy and Laurie said, which is there is a, a disposition. There is a, a particular way of thinking when you're considering the fact that education is no longer about content delivery, right? I mean, we can't just go up and, and compete with, with TikTok and YouTube. They have so much better graphics than what we do, right? So what we need to do is engage them in a way that is real and it's applicable. And I think that it begins with our mindset. It begins with us recognizing as educators that what we're doing is we're preparing the next Dr. Lynn Margulis, Dr. Rosalind Franklin, Dr. Jennifer Dubna, Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier. We are truly preparing these future stewards of the world to solve the issues. And so in that way, I think, it's where we position ourselves. It's not just about assessments or fulfilling some state requirements. It's really about preparing these young minds to address the problems that they're going to inherit, sadly. And I can only imagine that that will serve a dual purpose, not only to help teachers make these connections with students, but also to help sort of re-inspire teachers. Um, the why of why teachers go into the profession um, and, and sort of remember your why as well as an educator. Um, so I, I, I want to not take any more time um, using up your presentation time because I know all three of you have some great examples to share and some um, resources that you've used and approaches that you've used in the past. Um, so we always like to have practical examples and resources for our participants. So I will say for those who are in our audience, we are hoping to have some time for Q&A at the end. So if you do have questions as you hear our presenters share, um, please put them in the chat. We'll be collecting them and we will ask them at the end of the round table. So I'll begin by inviting Lori to share her screen and to walk us through her examples that she brought with her today. Lori, over to you. Here we go. Um, can everybody see the screen? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I am going to, this is just my title slide. Let me move on to the next one. Here we go. Sorry, I need to, I've got two screens. And when I move this, it changed my orientation of everything. So I'm going to just move things a little bit for myself here. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about three strategies that we utilize at Brockton High School. So they include um, curriculum connections with just your standard course, um, developing a course that's aimed at embedding career connections within it. We've got a capstone course for our seniors that serve as our example for that. 
um, and then developing an after school enrichment course, which we also have. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about each of those. All right. All right, so Career Connections, obviously Abe is our first one. We're all here because of Abe and um, the value that it brings in terms of turning the molecular biology and the central dogma um, and essentially showing kids how the central dogma is used to create genetic medicines. And we have been really fortunate that we've been able to not just um, carry out the laboratories, but get volunteers from um, Amgen Labs to come in and give guest presentations or panel discussions where they talk about their career path, the kind of job they do, what does their day-to-day -day look like? Um, and, and so meshing both the learning with the real people that do this on the day-to-day -day, um, is very impactful for students. Um, and, and student comments afterwards always reflect that. You know, we've asked kids to reflect on why it's important you know, the kinds of things we mentioned earlier always come up is like, you know, I had, uh, it's exciting to see somebody that looks like me, or, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't realize this person, you know, could do something completely different, and then come back and do biotechnology later in life. So like, it gives them the whole gamut of possibilities. So that's very, very empowering. Um, also, we have some project based learning things. So one project that we have is, an anatomy and physiology project that is modeled after building Frankenstein. And so this is really a bioengineering challenge that is the, the project for them uh, as they learn anatomy and physiology. So we're fortunate that we have um, an engineering, bioengineering company not too far from us and they visited us this year. So during remote school, we actually had a remote scientist come in and you know talk about what his path was and that was great and kids really enjoyed it but we thought once we were in back in person we would like to have them you know bring some examples of artificial this or that they, the kids could actually you know put their hands on and they could describe well what is the evolution of of their design and then they also gave feedback to students as they were developing their models of how they would put their body system into the Frankenstein model. Um, so if you have, if you have something that kids are doing that mimics, even if it's in a very simple way, things that scientists do in real life, um, just making a cold email to people in the company, um, you know, go in LinkedIn, figure out who's in your area, and reach out to them because a lot of people are really, they enjoy getting a day off. A lot of companies will give time to their employees to make these kinds of connections. Um, uh, again, field trips. I think I don't wanna to say too much about this because I know Wendy's gonna probably say that. And then, um, and scientist visitors. So I just touched upon just any, any time you can have practicing scientists, whether it be academic scientists or scientists um, from, an industry setting, it's it's just exciting for kids to have those conversations. All right, so I want to segue into talking about our senior capstone course. So this is a year long project that we have where kids are trying to discover new antibiotics. So they're doing citizen science. They're learning about um, different microbes and soil, learning about the soil as a living thing, a living entity that can be studied and conducting this original research to learn about all the skills as well as the, you know, how to study and why we're studying um, microorganisms from the environment and how they might be employed to develop new antibiotic therapeutics. So it's both content and lab skills learning. Um, students have a lab notebook, they can do electronic lab notebooks and, and it's fantastic because you can just you can see their progress evolve over the year. Um, we're really fortunate that we've got a connection with scientists at Tufts Infectious Disease. Prior to the pandemic, our students presented their, um, their capstone project to scientists there. And then through the pandemic, that wasn't an option. This year, we were excited to go back 
Um, we had scientists from Tufts coming in and they talked about the research in December, develop those kind of interpersonal connections with students right off the bat. And then we, we were able to say, you know, you heard the kinds of work these folks are doing. We set that bar for them, that expectation of achievement for them so that they realized these scientists were gonna be now evaluating the work that they did come May. And it was super exciting. And kids were, kids were blown away because they realized they had learned so much that they never expected to learn. That's one. And then the second is their skills. Some of them had pretty good hands. And, you know, I would always say you take pictures of everything so that when, when it comes time to build your poster, you have that information there. And so a number of kids had really nice examples of streak plates. So this is where you take bacteria. Well, Abe teachers know what a streak plate is, presumably, um, trying to get isolated colonies. And some of them had fantastic examples. And they all got really positive feedback from the scientists saying, you know, there's practicing microbiologists that still aren't as good as what your street plate is. So anytime you can pull those kids into an environment where they're seeing people who have do devoted their lives now, right? So um, students are, you know, in grad school, they're six, eight, 12 years post um, high school, and they've devoted their, their lives to this line of research and they can see where the year that they spent is meaningful to people. All right, and I just wanna just wrap up with our after-school program. So our after-school program, we're funded uh, by the Massachusetts Life Sciences Fund. And we've been fortunate to do this for the past six years. It's a nine week program where students three days a week, they're spending about nine to 10 hours a week after school with us. And we're essentially taking Abe and blowing it up. So instead of the red fluorescent protein, our target protein of choice in this case is luciferase. Um, we chose that because it's an enzyme and we can measure its activity. So we can extend what we do with RFP going into um, looking at the purification process and the specific activity of the purified protein at the end of the day. Um, and because this is an after-school program, we foster both collaboration of small groups of students as well as um, foster independence. Um, and so, you know, we will scaffold the learning of kids, but anytime they've done something one time, we want them to be able to write out that procedure the next time and then TAs and teachers will come around and check and make sure that they know what they're doing. So the goal is so that when they move on to a summer internship, that they have these skills. If somebody asks them to pour a gel, they know how to do that on their own. Um, and so we have a few internship connection partners, the Dana-Farber, Forsyth Institute, Reagan Institute, and a number of others that have taken our students in the summer. And, and again, kids, so it's both a summer job as well as a networking opportunity. Kids come back from both from our program, but especially these summer internships, they the what they envision for themselves is completely transformed by these experiences. So it's very cool. And that was my last slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. I was waiting for the significant pause, but um, I loved hearing about these opportunities that you've, these doors you've opened for your students. I know in many places, those apprenticeships and internships are kind of the gold standard and they're easier or harder to find depending on your location and how much access you have to those industry partners. But it's certainly something that if you can manage that, that um, it's, it's, as you say, transformative, Lori. And um, just being able to really do the work and to know that you can do the work can change your whole sense of self. Um, so Lori, thank you so much for sharing all of that. There's so much to absorb here. Um, we had a couple of questions just about the age groups for capstones. Um, and I wanted to also just recognize that whole kind of in school, out of school parallel that you've got going so that students have exposure in these kind of different settings. Um, and so I now want to thank you and turn to Wendy for some specific examples of how you integrate career connections into your science classroom and all of the wonderful connections that you've made. Wendy? 
Okay, um, so all I have is a graphic here that kind of is a um, a growth chart or a, a evolution um, of how I've been able to make industry connections. And I think in terms of a strategy, um, I did learn most of this uh, when I did robotics because um, uh, we needed a lot of community support for manufacturing, that kind of thing. Um, and so just um, being able to uh, not be intimidated to approach industry uh, contacts or hearing connections that can be made, um, trying, you know, just going and asking for, you know, some type of, of articulation um, has been extremely successful. So, you know, just basically go for it and don't be afraid to try to get anybody in the community or, um, you know, even, I mean, sometimes it's been across country um, to help with your, your program and the, the opportunities you wanna bring to your students. So um, basically the evolution of our program, um, it started, uh, and actually I have to say it did start before I got involved with ADE um, because I actually went to grad school with Bruce Wallace who uh, started ABE um, at UCLA. And um, I remember when Winston Salzer's lab of which Bruce was a part, um, you know, left UCLA and went over to the dark side. Um, we were all, you know, just what's going on here because it's the first time that, you know, really um, biotechnology um, was becoming commercialized. And so it was something where it was leaving academia. But in any event, um, after starting up, uh, trying to start up a biomedical science pathway, um, I got introduced to the ABE program. Um, and I have to admit that Karen Steinhauer, who is on our, uh, is, is here at the round table, helped provide a lot of of these connections, um, you know, always emailing us of, oh, here's this opportunity and that opportunity and so on. So, you know, the ABE sites have been very, um, you know, important in helping us reach out and expand. So that's greatly appreciated. Um, the first uh, connection that um, I got involved with was um, after learning about ABE, I found out that they had a leadership symposium or what they call DNA boot camp at Cold Spring Harbor with the DNA Learning Center. And so I attended that. It was, uh, you know, two or three weeks in the summer. Um, and from there, I learned about all, ty uh, all kinds of um, different programs and trainings through Cold Spring Harbor that I went to, you know, um, GMO detection, mitochondrial DNA haplotype. We actually made that a, an, an integral part of our 10th grade um, identity project uh, where the students get their um, mitochondrial DNA uh, haplotype from sequencing their mitochondrial um, control region um, and uh, you know, seeing which out of Africa group they belong to. Um, the genes to cognition uh, program, the RNAi knockdown in C. elegans, which then allowed me, they had a, an additional training at Pasadena City College where I met Dr. Wendy Johnston, who in Southern California is like the guru for biotechnology, um, which then led to you know, our connection with uh, the Pasadena Bioscience Collaborative um, and because they're a, a ABE dis distribution center now. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of things that came from that. Um, but basically the, the curriculum that I was able to bring through that connection with Cold Spring Harbor was, um, you know, very, very uh, valuable. Um, uh, another connection that uh, Karen Steinhauer uh, connect, uh, you know, made us aware of was Coastal Marine Biolabs because they were initially an ABE dis distribution center, 
And um, so they were, uh, they have summer workshops for students, but they also have educational outreach. And that's where I learned DNA barcoding. And I guess, David, you also do, I, you know, eyeball and the um, uh, basically using DNA barcoding um, where we then were able to connect with um, CSUCKY, otherwise known as CSU Channel Islands. So now um, we go to the island twice a year um, and uh, collect specimens and, and do um, other uh, things to monitor uh, biodiversity using DNA barcoding. Um, so that's been, you know, um, a, a great uh, opportunity for our kids, especially some kids learning that uh, they prefer field work compared to, um, you know, lab lab work. So they're they're identifying what things they have a passion for. Um, from that experience, we um, uh, were able to meet up meet with Dr. Gina Drake uh, from UCLA. She works on coral and algal proteomics, and so now we've established. Uh, a program at our school. It's also after school. Um, uh, and the kids get data from uh, LC mass spec from the researchers of the peptides. Uh, and they basically end up sequencing the protein, you know, de uh, determining the sequence of the protein and using bioinformatics to analyze the proteins and take it all the way to a, a structure, protein structure. Um, uh, then from uh, uh, Wendy D Johnston and the um, Pasadena Biosc uh, Bioscience Collaborative, uh, they were in the same building as, as the Oak Crest Institute of Science. And so I was able to actually do a summer externship with them on the delivery of cancer drugs. Um, like uh, um, ABE, they provide speakers and mentors, and they were especially helpful during COVID um, when they would do um, a lot of uh, uh, curricular activities and, and have speakers and panels um, that we could attend with Zoom. Um, from them, one of their one of the um, scientists then went to USC and we were able to then connect with um, Dr. Morsuit, uh, who does synthetic biology. And he comes to um, our school and gives lectures. And then he gives the kids challenges um, that uh, his lab is working on to de design genetic circuits that um, uh, get cells to, to form into tissues and different structures. And just last week, our, our students went and presented their uh, solutions to these challenges to his, um, at his lab meeting. So the, they were, the students were presenting to postdocs and um, uh, graduate, uh, graduate students on um, the research, the ideas that they had. Um, and, and again, that's what led to um, the synthetic biology curriculum that I did as an Amgen master teacher. Um, another contact that we got through um, ABE was the Biocom Institute, and they connected us with uh, the Illumina, um, Illumina Genetic Discovery Program. And so our kids uh, this past year have been doing whole genome sequencing, and we were actually able to get an iSeq 100. Um, so our kids are, you know, have, have that skill and they, they can, you know, th consider those types of careers in, in bioinformatics and things like that. That's what uh, then connected us with Ellison Institute of Transformative Medicine. Um, where um, we're, I'm at right now with a group of 40 students. Um, we have a program where they come to our um, medical interventions class and present lessons on cancer and, um, you know, the hallmarks of cancer, model organisms, um, toxicology uh, measurements of drugs, and so on. 
and um, they actually uh, donated an ion torrent next generation sequencing um, uh, machine to us. Um, so that connection was amazing. Um, in the meantime, uh, after we first started doing ABE, we were connected with uh, community colleges, LA Valley College and Pierce College. Um, with LA Valley College, the um, students uh, uh, did their certificate pathway, and that's where we were connected with Dr. Aurora Schallender, who is now an, uh, leads the ABE Distribution Center at uh, LA Valley uh, LA Mission College. She she moved over, and that was uh, um, the segue into our kids doing dual enrollment for uh, biotechnology class. Um, uh, we also. Uh, then connected with Pierce College uh, with uh, Dr. Kamajaya, uh, we wrote a, a NSF grant to develop a, a biotech pathway that had a very cool twist to it. The biotech three, the third class is actually an internship. And I'm sure with high school students, we're all aware that at least in biotechnology, it's very difficult to get students into an internship because you have to be 18 and over, which most of the students are not. And then they always worry about the liability. Well, by making this um, class part of a community college course, um, the kids are able to uh, actually get an internship. And this course runs as if it were a biomanufacturing company. And our kids piloted the program where they, you know, basically develop the um, way to prepare to biomanufacture TAC polymerase to do all of the QC and um, testing to make sure they could deliver it. And so now they provide it to other high schools and community colleges. Um, so, you know, they're getting a real, um, uh, a real uh, accurate, uh, it, you know, look at what it's like to work in biomanufacturing in the biotech industry. Um, so just basically with um, a number of these different opportunities, um, you know, we've been able to give our kids uh, real world experiences, allow them to develop skills, give them the confidence to know that they can be successful in uh, the field of biotechnology. And it all basically started with, I guess we can say Bruce Wallace wanting to get biotechnology and what goes on in the, you know, in um, the real world, getting it into the classroom. And um, so these are just, you know, some, some examples of how mm -hmm. we've been able to network through our association with Amgen and ABE to provide all of these opportunities for students. Wendy, this has just been glorious to see how this web kind of grew. And <laughs> I so appreciate you walking us through that. And we do have a question in the chat for you about how do you how do you go about making those connections? So I'm gonna encourage you to go ahead and respond to that in the chat if you're able to, because in the meantime, I wanna make sure we have time for David to share some of the approaches he's taken with his students. So if David, um, are you able to, maybe Wendy, you can stop sharing your screen and we can invite David to share his and we can hear how he's approached career connections. David? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I do have a lot of redundancy between what both uh, Lori and Wendy have shared already. There's some things that are um, very much the same, such as the idea of citizen science. Um, I also participate in the barcoding project. And so uh, instead of just talking and, you know, if, if my wife were here, she would tell you that if you tell me that I have to speak for 10 minutes, you have to say five because I'm going to always run long. So I, I'm really going to try my best. I, I apologize. It's going to feel rushed, but I want to also be uh, aware of your time and conscientious aware of the fact that we only have a few minutes. And so there are obviously some purposes and some reasonings for, you know, some explanations as to why this is important. And I could go over these. 
but I, I'd like to really focus on, on the last one more than anything else. So of course, it's going to increase motivation and engagement, and it's going to help students with their future employability. And of course, it's going to increase the ability for students to see application to, to their knowledge and to explore uh, careers and decision-making to align sort of, so, but all of these are fundamentally uh, still sort of uh, economically driven. And, and they're, they're, they, they miss what I think is the most significant component, which is this increased humanity. So rather than talking, let me share with you some photos. That's all I want to do with you and maybe give you a very short uh, description of what, what we see here. So in one of my classes, uh, one of the things that's very important in my class is that we have people from the outside coming in. This does two things. Number one, it allows the people from the outside to see the greatness of my students. So here, for example, in the very middle uh, is this young man that's next to me. Now, I, I know he looks like he's a student, but he's not. He's a physical therapist, uh, but he happens to be a physical therapist uh, who is very young. And, and my students connected with him right away, asked all kinds of questions. Uh, this is the same class. So you're going to see the same students. These are all from this year. Uh, and because I so often have people from the outside coming in, they're getting really used to what it's like to engage with professionals. This helps them to develop skills such as engaging in a way that is productive. Uh, here, this is a visit by uh, the Brown Medical School. Uh, and in the back there, you see that gray haired man, that's uh, Dr. Diaz. And I can call him that because he and I went to college together and we had the same mentor. Uh, he is a primary care physician who works with the community. So he came in and he also brought another physician as well as uh, a gentleman named Luxon who works at the medical school. So they came in and talked to my students about their career path. Here are students also from Brown University that came in. You're gonna see again, similar, all my students are the same. Um, and I, I hope you also recognize immediately that my students are, uh, as, as sort of as, as Wendy would have said, you know, a, a, a in, inclusive of a large, diverse group of people. Uh, here they are again. In this case, a young lady with a baby is actually a former student who is now a um, medical imaging expert. And so she came in and she talked to my kids. And um, this is consistently the way it is. And I, I want to finish with this one. You see the three gentlemen in the back. They are... Um, as you can see, significantly older than my students. They are all war veterans. Uh, and the gentleman who's holding, what you can't see there, uh, it's um, our class um, lizard. So we, we, have a, a, we have several pets, but that's one of them. And um, he is a survivor of uh, cardiac arrest. And he came in to teach my students um, and certify them in both CPR as well as first aid. And one of the things that's really powerful is the three gentlemen there, um, when they left, they, they said that they that was the best class they ever had. My students were the best students they ever had. And they've been doing this for, for many, many years. And so what it did, that kind of visit, not only did it help in immediately improve my students' skills and sense of who they are, but it also allowed people that normally don't interact with my students to see the greatness in them. And so this was a, a, a dual win for all of us. Um, I have one more here, that lady with the dress there in the front. Um, she is a public health researcher that I worked with at Brown, uh, and she came in to talk to my students. Uh, here's another one. This was a former student, uh, I'm sorry, a former teacher, and he came in to talk about his role growing up in the city and dealing with mental health and, and um, sort of the anxiety that comes with that. And this last picture from that class, uh, the gentleman on the far left, he is a... Um, I guess he would be considered a computer programmer. He's a programmer who works with neuroscience. And one of the things he does is he is one of the people that uh, has helped develop that technology of remotely controlling robots through through the, the just thinking itself through neural activity. So he came in, he talked to the kids. They absolutely loved it. They engaged with him. Um, another thing I want to bring, bring out again, reiterate what already been said is bringing experts of the, the content that you're covering. In the case, the gentleman in red, I don't know if you know that is, but that's uh, Dr. Ken Miller. Uh, he is a recently retired professor at Brown University who comes into my classroom every year. And one of the things that happens is that uh, he tells my students about the new parts of biology that have to be included in his textbook. So this is Miller from the Miller and Levine textbook. And so he talks about his personal story, how he got to where, to, to where he is, uh, and then describes what's new in biology, why biology is a, an exciting area of, of academic um, sort of inquiry. 
Another thing that I feel is important is, again, this uh, citizen science. And I know that in this call today, we have Dr. Osgood, and I am so thankful for her support because even though it's not part of the sort of traditional Abe program or the Bruce uh, uh, Wallace uh, program, she has continued to help me to make sure that my students are doing real science uh, in the sense that, uh, for example, this is a picture I took during February vacation. So there was no one else in the school except these 47 students and I, uh, and they came in specifically to take care of their B samples. So when the students realize that this is authentic, real, uh, situated science, that this is legitimately something that is worth their time, they're going to step up their game. Um, I also wanted to mention this here. So the gentleman in the red uh, robes, or I'm sorry, not red, sort of uh, orange peach robes, that's Swami Yogat Mananda. And I could tell you a long story about him, but uh, this is not necessarily a scientist. This is someone who comes into the class and I have tons of pictures of him because he's been coming to my classroom literally for uh, dozens of years. And what he does is he comes to describe to my students what his path was. And what we do is we also do this pre and post uh, where we look at the effects of meditation on physiological um, uh, metrics. So we measured... Um, heart rate, uh, we measure breathing rate, we measure sort of semi-qualitatively, uh, quantitatively how their mood has changed. And so what the Swami does is he brings also someone that looks very different, not used to, not, not in the same way that my students are used to seeing. Uh, there are very few people from Asia in, in the city where I work. And so this is a great way to also increase who they are. And the last thing I want to finish with, because I know our time is running short here, is this idea of how can we take students and, be, and turn them into transformative intellectuals? So this is something that I've done officially for the first time, thanks to the little A mini grant. And what you have here is, that's my colleague, Nate Negray, but these are students, my students, teaching younger students about biotechnology, about science, and giving them the skills. And so what happens when that kind of interaction takes place is that my students are aware of their own knowledge, their own power, their own uh, significant contribution to the community. And the younger students are able to look at them and recognize that they look like them, that they can do something like this. They can see themselves in this kind of a situation. So this was a win-win for both the little kids or the, you know, they're not little, they're all taller than me, but the younger students, as well as uh, my students, uh, and here, for example, with the, the long hair is Maribel, who will be going to Providence College and definitely going into medical school. So I'd like to stop there. I know, I, again, I, I, I'm sorry that I had to rush, but that was the only way to get through all of that. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, David. And um, I know that we are wrapping up too, but I want to thank all of you who have been commenting and watching, and we will have this recording posted for all participants and we'll share our materials with our registered participants as well. I want to thank all of you for these lessons that we've been hearing about from all of you, engaging the whole student, keeping things authentic, um, thinking about things, experiences that are transformative. And so we'll continue to explore this idea of the how. Um, how do you go about building these relationships? But I want to wrap up with something that Wendy said, which is, you know, basically not being intimidated, be fearless, be courageous as you go to help make these connections for your students, because it's worth it. Um, because they can have these experiences and it transforms not only themselves, but as we just saw, can pay it backwards, forwards, down to younger students, and then you have systemic transformation. Um, so the power of career connections can really make the difference in how students see themselves. And I want to, again, thank our three master teacher fellows for joining us today and for sharing your experiences and your how. Um, I have a feeling we're going to be coming back and probably doing more on this topic um, in future roundtables. So thank you so much, all of you, for being with us today and have a great rest of your day.